Congressman Jeannie Raskin sits on the bipartisan committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. She's the author of Unthinkable Trauma Truth and the Trials of American Democracy, which is excellent, I have to say. And he joins me now. Um, Congressman, I want to start with your reaction to the RNC. Uh, everyone sort of knew some censure was coming. I have to say, I was personally legitimately taken aback by the language they chose to characterize it as legitimate political discourse and an official resolution of the Republican Party. How about you? Yeah, well, we knew they were coming after uh, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, uh, which is, in addition to everything else, completely undemocratic because they exercised or invoked this Rule 11, I think it is, under the RNC rules, basically saying that the RNC could start helping Cheney's opponent, even though the people haven't even met yet, which does sound a bit like a one-party dictatorship. But the real shocker, of course, was trying to sanitize the mob violence and the attempted coup on January 6th as legitimate political discourse. Um, you know, I think you pretty much uh, exploded the fallacies built into that. But I will add only that when they marched from the White House over to the Capitol, uh, you know, I'm a I'm a progressive, so I've been involved in a lot of protests. And mm -hmm. usually when you get to the Capitol, if you're there interested in legitimate political discourse, there will be a stage, there will be microphones, there will be speakers, there will be music. None of that was there. The whole point of marching everybody down was precisely to provoke the confrontation. And they had organized that insurrectionary band of the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, the Proud Boys, the militia groups, the QAnon networks, they came ready to fight and they uh, stormed the Capitol. They smashed our windows. They broke down our doors. And of course, they attacked our police officers, hitting them over the head with steel pipes and Trump flags and Confederate battle flags and American flags and so on. And that went on for four or five hours on that day. So they knew exactly what they were doing. And we are uh, determining the full scope of this effort to uh, overthrow the election, which was clearly Donald Trump's uh, intention. And he made it clear over the weekend when he said that uh, his vice president uh, clearly had the power to uh, overturn the election. And uh, that's why Pence made his speech at the Federalist Society today. But the sum and substance of that speech was embodied in a memo that he passed out right before we got on the floor at one o'clock on January 6th, saying he simply did not have the power to do what Donald Trump and all the Republicans were asking him to do. Yeah, what was your what was your reaction to the speech that Pence gave today and then and, and the reaction in that room in the Federalist Society down in Florida? Well, I'm always of two minds about it, because that's what passes for uh, courage in the Republican Party today. Of course, it's not courage at the level of Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, who are willing to call out the big lie in all of its implications. I mean, Mike Pence should be out there saying that it is a scandal that Donald Trump is dangling pardons in front of hundreds right. or perhaps thousands of people who participated in the insurrection. Um, he should be calling out the fact that Donald Trump is trying to replace Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger with Jody Heiss, and he's trying to systematically eliminate anybody from the Republican Party who refused to do his bidding uh, in the weeks leading up to January 6th. So I think that Mike Pence could step it up now, and he may as well do it because he's clearly going to be a pariah based on having restated the obvious, which is he had no power to single-handedly overturn the election. At this point, he should tell the truth about the whole thing, and he should join the party of democracy here, which is not a political party, but it's everybody in America who wants to defend our institutions and our values against the GOP, Lincoln's party, which has become the party of Donald Trump and disunion and violence. What's so striking about the timing is that the, the resolution comes after a period in which the former and impeached president is, is ratcheting up his endorsement, right? Is, is saying things like, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking about pardoning them. He sent out a poll today from his campaign about pardoning them. And, and you make a good point there that, that Pence can only muster a sort of technical point about whether the ministerial role of vice president there is to unilaterally overturn the election or not. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's still in a very legalistic mode and he's acting as if perhaps he could 
continue to curry favor with uh, Donald Trump and somehow ingratiate himself with Trump supporters. I mean, they, they hate Mike Pence now more than they hate me based on what he did. Yeah. I mean, they were calling him a traitor on that day. They were chanting, hang Mike Pence. Uh, Pence should wake up uh, and understand that our whole constitutional democracy is under attack now. Um, and Donald Trump is indeed the threat. I mean, does he think that that was sort of a one day lapse in the otherwise good behavior of Donald Trump? Uh, that's not the Donald Trump America has come to know. Uh, he is an enemy of our constitutional order. Well, in the in the in the doc that that, that airs uh, this week, and I believe on Sunday, there's a moment that I had actually forgotten until I saw it there, which is Michael Cohen's testimony, in which Michael Cohen, who of course was Trump's fixer and bagman, um, basically says, "Look, if he loses, look out." Here, 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 here's that section of the documentary. Given my experience working for Mr. Trump, I fear that if he loses the election in 2020, that there will never be a peaceful transition of power. And this is why I agreed to appear before you today. Michael Cohen did issue a stark warning to the country that if Donald Trump lost, there would be no peaceful transition. There's no way he would accept it. That is a frightening and startling thing for the president's own lawyer to say about him. But it seemed far off at that point to a lot of people. And people have said from the beginning, there's no way he would do that. There's no way anybody would do that. There does seem to be this constant inability for all of us to, or a lot of people to, to, to wrestle with what they're, what is happening. And I thought today's resolution was a sort of another stark moment like that, and I wonder whether that has an effect. Well, the, you know, the rewriting of the history of January 6th to be legitimate political discourse is just a fascist tactic. Yeah. I mean, that's what authoritarian movements do, and that's what they say. Um, and I think we have to reckon with the reality of it. And one of the things that I have condemned myself for, um, you know, in my book is that uh, I didn't take it seriously enough. We should have been planning very seriously for a full-blown coup and insurrection on January 6th. And we weren't. We were still playing within the bounds of uh, parliamentary tactics. And at this point, we have to understand this guy has positioned himself outside the constitutional order. He has demonstrated himself perfectly willing to use violence against us. And he does not accept our elections. He does not accept uh, our constitutional system. And he doesn't accept anybody contradicting him in any way, including his own vice president who helped him get elected, including members of his family yeah. who try to get him to call off the dogs when there's an insurrection happening. Um, Congressman Jamie Raskin, thank you so much for your time. You know, one of the uh, great things about your book and the documentary Love and Constitution is that uh, you also get to learn a bit about your incredible son, Tommy, who you lost last year, uh, who is the subject of, of part of your book and, and the documentary. And um, that alone is a, a, a wonderful part of getting to know the story. Love and the Constitution premieres this Sunday at 10 p.m. on MSNBC. Mm -hmm.